Ich hatte so einen starken Heulkrampf. I had a strong crying fit. I was shaking all over. I was just crying. But at the same time, a strong energy of love came from above. I wanted to sink into the ground, but I also felt a strong sense of joy. It was all there at the same time. Then I saw an apparition of light floating on the sea outside the ship. It's hard to describe. It was like a standing eye in rainbow colors in all directions. I saw it hovering over the sea and felt a great love. For me, it was an experience of oneness. At that moment, I knew that I had died in Auschwitz. That was all. I also knew that there was still a lot of pain, but it immediately dissolved at that moment. Mr. Oberholzer, you are an architect. You also work as a musician. You have had experiences that have convinced you that there is life after death. Not only that, but there is also reincarnation. I would like to start with an experience that took place after a serious diagnosis. You learned, I think, when you were 38 years old, that you had thyroid cancer. What did you experience back then? The thyroid problem started five years earlier, when I was 33 years old. I was treated for five years, initially by my GP. I later went to a specialist because my GP didn't know what to do or realized that he couldn't do anything more with his medication. After five years of relatively strong drug treatment, the specialist was of the opinion that nothing more could be done with the medication and that it would be better to operate on the thyroid gland. At the same time, he noticed that there was a relatively large lump on the thyroid gland. From what he said, it was clear to me that he feared something bad, cancer, something like that. I don't know why, but something inside me resisted simply removing something surgically. I can't say what it was. It was just a feeling that told me I wanted to do it differently. Then I came home. We didn't have children yet, but there were two of us. I didn't want to worry my wife, so I didn't tell her much about it. Though I did hint at something. I told her that something was wrong with me. We talked about what we could do better. I decided for myself that I wanted to change something in my life. I told myself that I would go for a half-hour walk by the lake before work and that I wanted to approach the day a little more consciously. Did you realize that there were psychological factors in the background that led to the illness? I didn't realize it, but I had the feeling that it might be the case. My wife had already started to take an interest in spiritual or health-related topics. I don't remember exactly what the reason for this was, because we hadn't thought about it that way before. She thought it might be good if I tapped my thyroid gland while walking. I did, and somehow I intuitively thought of the word love. 
I kept breathing in and out deeply. When I breathed in, I thought of the word love, and when I breathed out, I thought of peace. I did this regularly, every morning. Then, after about two weeks, I realized that I had nothing left. Everything was blown away. It just wasn't there anymore. I had quite a big goiter here on my neck. The thyroid was quite swollen, so it was very visible. I was also very thin because of the thyroid. After my next visit to the doctor, I decided that I wouldn't take any more tablets. I'd leave it all out for now. I want to see if it stays that way, that I really have nothing left. I had a feeling that there was nothing left. And, indeed, there was nothing left. The doctor said it, it couldn't be that I was a different person. He questioned whether I was Mr. Oberholzer at all. He was very skeptical, but he saw the values and also saw that there was nothing left. I confirmed it. Everything was gone. What I noticed immediately, I became clairsentient during this time. I don't know how it happened, but I suddenly realized a lot about other people, especially the physical problems they had. I could feel in my body what the problem was with others. If someone had a heart problem, I got palpitations. If someone had problems with walking, I also had problems with walking. I soaked it up like a sponge. I always felt it for maybe a quarter of an hour, and then it slowly passed again. What was it like? Were you simply clairsentient towards all people, or did this only show with people who were close to you? I still don't know exactly. I have the feeling that I don't feel it immediately with everyone. I can't say why that is. I assume more people must have something. I don't always feel anything immediately, but I do notice it several times a day. Still today? Still today, that has remained. The worst thing is bad thoughts. When someone thinks bad things, my head aches. Very aggressive thoughts are like being stabbed in the head. That hurts a lot. But I also feel the other side. When someone is very happy, I feel a tingling sensation, as if leaves are rising in my head. That's very nice. Or when people are happy. I always compare it to the sparkle of champagne. That's how I feel. But you realize that it comes from outside that it doesn't come from your own body. No, it's not always clear to me. If I'm not quite sure, I ask. Then I get the answer. I then realize I am me and I clearly feel myself. When I realize this, it becomes clear to me whether I feel someone else. Looking back on your spontaneous recovery, was there something that was decisive, certain sensations or the certainty that you would recover? Or did it come as a complete surprise to you? That was very surprising. I hadn't dealt with these topics at all up to that point. I remember being interested in these topics as a child, but later, after I was 18 years old, this interest was no longer there. In other words, the only concrete feelings you consciously worked with were love and peace. I have recognized the value of love and peace through this clairsentience. 
I have realized that when I do a meditation like this, I can feel a channel opening up inside me. Something intensifies. In retrospect, I have to say that something opened up back then, something came to me. For me, it's a kind of divine energy. Love, I realized afterwards, is the highest energy. For me, God is unconditional love. Another decisive experience for you was realizing how you had died in your past life, that you have lived at all, that reincarnation exists. How did you first experience the fact that there was something from the past? What was the decisive factor for you? I only realized this at the age of 38, shortly after this self-healing experience. My wife also fell ill at the same time. We were both self-employed at the same time and both had our own companies. She became severely depressed, you could also call it burnout. We were pretty desperate, especially her. We didn't know how to alleviate it or how to deal with it. Through my experience with self-healing, we also started to take an interest in alternative medical methods. We also started meditating. We saw it as a way of achieving something. We had seen an advert in a local magazine for a young woman who offered group meditation. So we went to this meditation. It was also about getting to know your own spiritual guide. I laughed a bit about it. I didn't know there was such a thing, but I went along anyway. She then gave instructions on what we should do. Suddenly, a condor bird appeared inside me. I had never experienced anything like it before. So I recognized this condor and asked him his name. He replied that his name was Krakow. That was a bit strange for me, because Krakow is a city in Poland. That was all I knew about this name. It was all I knew. I was a bit skeptical and asked the meditation leader, that doesn't mean anything to me now. I can't do anything with it. She said that if you come into contact with this word within a week, then it confirms that the name has significance and that I had heard it correctly. Otherwise, I didn't need to pay any further attention to it. A day or two later, I had a work meeting in Zurich with a construction company I was working with at the time. We went out for dinner together in the evening. There were about six people there, including a woman who came from the former GDR and said to me, Roman, I was on holiday in Krakow. You have to go there too, it's so beautiful. I was quite taken aback. It didn't have any effect on me beyond that, but I thought there must be something to it. A little later, we went on holiday to a country house in the Czech Republic because my parents-in-law are from the Czech Republic. They live here in Switzerland, but they had a country house there. We went there because we appreciated the fact that it was quite remote. We tried to meditate there together. And that was the first time a white light appeared inside me. I had never experienced anything like that before, but it made me very happy and curious. 
I wasn't familiar with it. I didn't have much experience of meditation and I hadn't read anything about it. A few days later, an image suddenly appeared in my mind. I saw a picture of a man on the run. He was outside a wire mesh fence that was clamped between concrete posts and a watchtower. At the top were one or two men with machine guns. The other man I saw was outside the secured field. I only realized this later. That was a concentration camp I had seen, Auschwitz. At the time I saw it in my mind, I had no idea what it was. I wrote it down in a notebook that I started to keep at the time, in which I also wrote down dreams and things like that. A few months later, my wife and I went on holiday to Greece with my parents-in-law. We travelled by boat from Italy to Greece. One morning, I got up very early and went on deck. It was about six in the morning. I didn't want to wake the others and I thought I'd go on deck. I knew that there was a map on deck with the routes and a larger section of Europe. So I thought I'd see where Krakow was. So Krakow was still somehow present to you? Yes, it was still present. It still resonated with me. I just couldn't make sense of what the name meant to me. Then I came to this map and searched for Krakow. At the same moment, I saw that next to Krakow was Auschwitz. When I saw that, it exploded inside me. It's hard to describe. I was just crying. I had a crying fit. My whole body was shaking and I just cried. But at the same time, a strong energy of love came from above. It, it's hard to describe. It was pure love, like I had never felt before, and a strong feeling of humility, but also of shame. I wanted to sink into the floor, but I also felt a very strong sense of joy. It was all there at the same time. Outside the ship, on the sea, I saw an apparition of light floating. It's difficult to describe. It was like a standing eye in rainbow colors, in all directions. I saw it, and I felt this great love. For me, it was an experience of oneness. At that moment, I knew that I had died in Auschwitz. Nothing more, just that, and that there was a lot of pain associated with it. But the pain immediately dissolved at that moment. I had a crying fit. For half an hour I just cried and shook. But I also realized that I had done a lot of things wrong in my life so far, that I regretted. They were small things, too. It wasn't just about big things. I thought, I don't want to do this anymore. In this memory, everything was just there at once. So you were aware of situations and circumstances from your life? Yes, somehow it was. It was all there. It was all there for a split second. I didn't see it. It's hard to describe. It was just all there. And I realized that I had to change my life. Near-death experiences also often report such experiences of unity. 
A special aspect of this is the so-called hyperreality. They say what they experienced was more real than real. What was that like for you? Was it also extremely real, or did you experience it more as a kind of dream? No, not at all. It wasn't a dream. On the contrary. The scales fell from my eyes. It was a dramatic experience for me, because I realized that I had been living in a dream world. I was also shocked, almost a little angry, that I hadn't known that. I find it hard to describe. Of course, I was very happy, but I was also sad. I still feel that way every day. I'm very sad that there aren't more people who know about it, that we are all born without this knowledge. So you experienced a kind of awakening? Yes, I realized that we were in a sleep state. I knew straight away that I couldn't go on living the way I had been. It was all very difficult at first. I came home and it was very difficult for me to continue living the way I was used to. I would have preferred to go into the woods on my own and withdraw. A lot of things were going wrong somehow. It was difficult to deal with it. Sometimes it's not at all possible to be aware of everything. It was normal for me, and I mainly enjoyed the material things. But that's over now. Were you able to talk to someone about the experience, including the new values that became relevant to you? My first conversation partner was, of course, my wife. I was also a bit euphoric and wanted to tell everyone that we were immortal. For me, that's the most important thing you need to know, that we are immortal. There is nothing more important to me. Then you're no longer afraid. You don't need to be afraid at all. Even if I die now, I'm not dead. It's just the body that's no longer there. Then you are a different form. But the thinking is the same. I think, no matter what state I'm in, it's always the same. It won't change. Maybe the perception is a little different, but the thinking is the same. I've realized that. That's why it's important how we think what we have in our consciousness, what we take with us, because we are what we think. That is our world, even if we are no longer in this body. How we think is how our world is. So you have, so to speak, begun to recognize not only the physical life here, but the greater totality of existence. And above all, that God exists. I mean, of course I prayed before, but I had no real connection to faith. That's hard to say. All of this has become a certainty for you. That became a certainty. I have now also recognized a responsibility within myself. I have seen how much suffering I can cause, even with small things. Can you give an example? For example, alcohol. I knew immediately that I wouldn't drink another drop of alcohol. I couldn't eat meat anymore either. I used to love eating it. But I felt the animals inside me. It's little things like that. Were there other experiences in your life that fitted in with this image of you dying in Auschwitz? I was then back at home. I have a garage for my car near my house in the old town of Rappersville. 
Suddenly, lying in front of the garage door was a ticket for a museum that was also in Rapperswil. Now it's no longer there, but somewhere else. The Polish museum was in the castle here in Rapperswil. I live not far from this Polish museum. There was an entrance ticket outside my garage door. If this is a door, then the ticket was here. It hadn't been used. The admission voucher was still on it. I had learned in the meantime that I had to pay a little attention to clues in everyday life, that you can get clues from other dimensions. The ticket was a clue for me. Maybe I should go there sometime. I took this hint seriously. But then I was back in my work routine. I put the ticket to one side and didn't go. A few months later, there were suddenly three tickets from this museum in front of my garage door again. That was a strong indication for me. It couldn't be a coincidence. What also needs to be said is, uh, I have noticed that whenever I have had strong experiences, a bird has usually appeared in the real world. A bird of prey, usually a buzzard, something like that. I always perceived something like that as my spiritual guide. I really experienced a presence. My spirit guide actually showed up as a condor, but there are no condors here in Switzerland. But I always saw a bird of prey circling above me. When I went up to the castle, that's up there, a hundred meters from here, I saw a bird of prey circling above me again. I knew something special was waiting for me, but I didn't know what. I went into this museum with this ticket that I'd been given, but I didn't know what to look at. There was an exhibition about various Polish personalities. But I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I wandered around and didn't know where to go. I just walked around the museum path. At the end, I came to a corridor in a small tower niche where a few things were on display. At the back of the alcove hung a concentration camp prisoner's robe. There was also a death certificate of a person hanging on the wall. And when I read his name, it exploded inside me again. I had the same feeling as on the ship, this trembling and strong crying. I couldn't do anything about it. It was as if the stopper of a barrel had been opened inside me and everything was gushing out. I saw the name of this concentration camp inmate and all these dates. Date of birth, date of death. I wrote that down. I didn't know this man. He wasn't a familiar figure to me. But I knew it was me. I knew it inside. It made me cry hard. I realized that this crying only happens once. I went back to the museum later to photograph everything. But I didn't have to cry again when I saw it. That was over. I then told my father about it, and he was very surprised. He said he even had a book about this man. What was the man's name? His name was Maximilian Kolbe. He was a Polish missionary. 
I did a bit of research on the internet and found out how he died. Suddenly, I realized a lot of things. As a child, I didn't want to eat. In a way, I refused to eat. My parents had great difficulties until I was two or three years old. And now, I realize why. Maximilian Kolbe ended up in the starvation bunker in the concentration camp. He had sacrificed himself for another person. This other person had tried to flee from the concentration camp. That was the man I had seen in my meditation on the other side of the fence. That was the other person. The henchman from the concentration camp had arrested this man and wanted to lock him up in the starvation bunker or shoot him for trying to escape. Then I said, in my last life, I will sacrifice myself in his place because I have no family. The man had a family. That was very difficult for him. I said, I don't have a family. It's no problem for me to die. So they put me in this starvation bunker. But I didn't die quickly enough and they executed me with a lethal injection. This food problem was a big issue in my life. I had difficulty eating a lot of things. It was also interesting that by the time I became aware of all this, when I realized it and saw the death certificate, I had also done a bit of numerology. Not very deeply, just out of curiosity. I realized that in my last life, I had exactly the same birth dates as my current wife in this life. I was born on the 8th of January. The year of birth had the same sum of digits as my wife's in this life. My wife's birthday is now also on the 8th of January, and the sum of the digits is the same. This is extremely striking for me. I calculated the probability of whether this could be a coincidence or not, and I've come to the conclusion that it can't be a coincidence. I'm a skeptical person. I also question things. I don't just accept anything. But for me, this was another reason to be able to accept these connections with my mind. Do you believe that this issue of vicarious suffering, sensing, also has to do with your clairsentience? Maybe, it's hard to say. I can't judge, but it's quite possible. What's also very interesting is, as a child, I was drawn to many things that had to do with my past life. I was always drawn to Mary. As a teenager, I bought a hologram of Mary. I thought it was a bit poppy and funny, but I put it up. It was a figure of Mary in a grotto. I learned to pray the Ave Maria from my grandmother at an early age. It was the only prayer I knew by heart, and I recited it regularly. Then I saw that this Maximilian Kolbe was a great devotee of Mary. Another affinity. I took it with me into this life, as well as my affinity to Eastern countries like Poland or the Czech Republic. I've always been interested in these countries. 
I also had friends from these countries, and my wife is from there. I am drawn back to this region. There is something that connects me to my previous life. Have you ever traveled to Auschwitz yourself to confront the historical facts? Yes, but at first I was almost a bit reluctant. I had the feeling that I had to go there again. I also started to occupy myself with dreams and realized that I was getting a lot of clues in my dreams. I was told that it would be good to go there. One day I was walking alone and I was drawn to a side street, to a church. I just followed the feeling to try going there. I didn't know the area consciously. I then saw that it was the church of Maximilian Kolbe. There was a picture of him hanging there. I also felt a connection. It was a bit difficult for me to go to the concentration camp. But I had a dream one night in the hotel that I wrote down. At first, I didn't know what it meant. But when I went for a walk in Krakow during the day, I saw the picture in a gallery on the market square. There was an office there that sold tickets for tourists to Auschwitz. That was a clear indication to me that I should go there. I travelled there with my wife. We travelled from Krakow to Auschwitz. Strong emotions came up. I also felt very clearly where I died, in that starvation bunker. I felt very strong pain in my solar plexus. A few emotions came up, but then they dissipated again. That was something special. I was able to deal with it somehow. It was okay for me. Knowing that I was immortal put it all into perspective for me. It wasn't so bad anymore. On the contrary, it was beautiful is perhaps the wrong word. But the fact that you can survive something so terrible and be reborn into a beautiful life is incredible to me. It's the greatest thing that you can slip into a new shell. But the consciousness is still there. On the contrary, there's probably more and more of it. From this awareness of the distancing, your experience of larger contexts, if you imagine meeting someone who you know for sure was responsible or partly responsible for the suffering back then, how do you think you would react? I would hug him and say, it's not so bad, it's all right. I feel like my wife was a part of this whole experience. I can't say what part she played in my last life, but she must have been an important part of it. Perhaps she had something to do with this lethal injection I received. That's a guess. She has a very strong aversion to injections in this life. But I can't say in what form. I can't say whether she was a fellow inmate or whether she gave me the injection. I don't want to judge it or say it must have been one way or another. But I just have this feeling. 
I only know, I also saw this in my dream, that when I left my body, I told her that we would meet again in Switzerland. We had agreed that. How did you get to know each other? In the corridor, in a disco. That's another feeling. She was already there, in the disco. She was 17, I was 22. Now I'm 53, that was 31 years ago. I went to that disco. That was in Lucerne, by the way. She was from Lucerne. I was from here. I was drawn to her like a magnet. Everything else faded out for me. I only saw her. Somehow I knew I wanted to get to know this woman. It's hard to describe, but I can still see that image today. It must have fixed me like an anchor, drawing me in. It's hard to describe. It's like quicksand. You can't resist it. And she has also accompanied you on your path of spirituality. Yes, we do it together. We support each other. So on the way to spirituality and on the path with spirituality. Yes, exactly. What significance do your spiritual experiences and abilities have for your everyday life? Have you ever thought about making something of it professionally? When I realized that I could perceive illnesses in other people, I initially had the feeling that there was a task for me. Healing or spiritual healing began to interest me. I also realized that there are ways of consciously directing energy. I sometimes perceive great pain in other people. I have also had this experience with children. Once, I was asked to lay my hands on them. This also caused the pain. I don't see any of it, but something has to dissolve energetically. Tears help with this. It then dissolves through the emotions. I started to come to terms with my life back then. Does it make sense to carry on as I have been living? I also had problems with my work. I no longer wanted to work as an architect. I felt a strong urge to work more with music. I had always made music on the side. It was my favorite hobby. I didn't do it professionally, but it always gave me great pleasure. I never neglected this hobby. I then also realized that I could use music to process my spiritual experiences a little. Not process them, but store them. For me, music was a way of storing what I had experienced. For me, music is an information carrier for the person making the music. I also realized that the music I made could have a healing effect. It creates a higher resonance. I felt that in my hands. When I listen to music, I start to sweat. I was able to perceive this through clairsentience. So I saw it as my task to make this music. Fortunately, I could afford it financially. I could take more care of my wife and make this music. At the same time, we saw it as our duty to start a family. 
We had never thought about whether we wanted to have a family or not. We never had time for it. I now realize that there had to be children. In hindsight, I realize that having a family is certainly a big part of my life's mission. I think that was also a great need, because I had already lived several lives as a priest, as a childless man. So, my desire to have a family was particularly strong now. The need was already very strong in me. My experiences were certainly also an enrichment. I was able to encounter children differently, to perceive them differently. We were certainly also able to prepare for the birth in a different way, thanks to our way of life. Thanks to my wife's strong will, the children were able to be born at home and enter a reasonably healthy world. We were also able to make emotional contact. It was also interesting that at the beginning, when the children were born, I had very intense dreams. I was able to dream about some of my son's past life. And develop a certain understanding of what he perhaps brings with him as a burden. You have had many meaningful experiences and have recognized connections. How do you view death today? With joy. I'm looking forward to it, I have to say. I was lucky enough to have an out-of-body experience spontaneously. It was a very beautiful experience. I was out of body and in an ecstatic state. I don't know if it will always be like that when you're out of your body or if it was just a brief moment. For me, it was a very beautiful experience that I had never had before. I have to say, if it's only going to be like this a few times outside the body, I'm really looking forward to it. When I came back into the body, I felt paralyzed at first. I couldn't move at all. Because of the confinement. I think it was simply the weight of the matter. Being outside felt so light that the weight of this body was a thousand times greater than what is measured in kilograms on Earth. It was several tons. I couldn't move this body, it was so heavy. That's why I thought I was paralyzed. But it was just so heavy in my perception. Slowly I was able to move a little again. More and more came and then I could move again. I think there must be an incredible lightness when you're out of your body. That's how I felt. All that remained of me were my energy channels. It was pure energy. That was really interesting. There's still a lot to discover, I'm convinced of that. When you're no longer in your body, the experience will be much greater than is possible here with our five senses, because there are many more senses involved. I believe it's simply important to move in the right direction in life, to focus on the good things, not the difficult things. Rather, on what's beautiful, light. I think that's a very good conclusion. Thank you very much for the interview. My pleasure.